The sermon that I have this morning is going to take a somewhat of a lengthy introduction to lay the groundwork for the very points I want to make. So I invite you to turn your Bibles in the New Testament to the letter to the book of Hebrews, or to the Hebrews, and I want you to turn it to those who are students of the Bible, to a very familiar chapter, chapter 11. And we're going to talk about faith. Now we're going to actually get down to the main part of what this is about, but I'm going to have to wait till later to let you know, Sonia, the title of this is The Besetting Sin. The Besetting Sin. So if you have your Bibles open to 11, we recognize that the word faith is a noun in the English language. Speaking of faith is a thing, and its verb form is believe, because it's a matter of action. I ought to keep that in mind when we're discussing faith and understand how it's used in the scriptures. But if we're going to discuss this, you'll notice that Chapter 11 begins by saying, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, you know, if you know your Bible, that faith as a thing, faith in God, faith in Christ, faith in the Bible as the Word of God, is formed in one, is strengthened in one, and grows in one, because of their knowledge of the Word of God. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So anytime somebody says they do something by faith, speaking as the oracles of God, then they're saying they're doing it as the Bible teaches. That's basically what Colossians 3.17 says. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. Now, actually, he's saying do it by faith. But you don't do it by proper faith or confidence or trust in God, Christ, and the gospel system or the New Testament system, except that uh, you do it as the Word of God leads you, guides you, and directs you because it's the source of our faith. So faith is substance of things expected that we earnestly desire to receive, such as heaven. And it's the evidence. Once I prove the Bible to be the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the final and complete revelation of God to man, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, then whatever it teaches is proof that thus and so is acceptable to God, is approved of God. Now, I recognize that in dealing with apologetics, we may go outside the Bible into nature and the design of nation, nature and things like that. We can prove the existence of God. But you can contemplate an oak tree all day long or the solar system, and you'll never learn what to do to be saved from your sins. That takes revelation. Thus, we're taught concerning the Word of God, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that is not to be ashamed. Ashamed before whom? God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing, there's a proper way to do this, the word of truth. And considering that one must have an honest and good heart for the seed of the kingdom, the word of God, take root in and grow and develop, Luke 8, 15, Luke 8, 11. Then you see how all of this comes back to the idea of faith. Faith is so important when Jude was exhorting brethren to fight against false teachers. False teacher teaches false doctrine. So it can't be the, doc the doctrine of Christ, can it? He said, contend earnestly for the faith. He pulled out faith as we've described it already. And let it stand for the whole New Testament system of salvation. It has to do with the whole thing and any component part of it. We're to contend for it. That means you've got to know what you're doing. You've got to study and so forth. So faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Then he begins to develop what we have as chapter 11. And remember, 
There were no chapters and verses in these letters when they were originally written. He begins to develop it. But he's writing to New Testament Christians and their background is being Jews and having lived under the law of Moses and they've been converted by the gospel of Christ and they're under persecution for being Christians and they're actually considering leaving the New Testament system that faith Jude said that we're here to contend for going back under the law of Moses. But notice how he, by inspiration, reaches back into patriarchy and the Mosaic system. And basically what he's saying, they never had what you had. They long for the day in which they could have it. Now you've got it and you understand the mystery that's in Christ. You know how God reconciles men to him. You know actual forgiveness of sins through Christ. You know the gospel plan of salvation, that it's the power of God to save, Romans 1, 16. Yet you're under duress because of your faith and you're actually thinking about leaving? What about these people? who never had what you had. Yet what did they do? Well, look at verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must. That's an imperative. You cannot get around it. You'll never be able to come to God correctly and be acceptable of Him except that you must believe that He is. But He doesn't stop there. He says... And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now once he's established what faith is, and now he's established the importance of it, he begins to develop it with these people I mentioned a while ago. Abraham and others. Abel and so forth. Noah. Noah. And he brings it all the way down because you see chapter 11 as we have it, remembering there are no chapters and verses, was really getting ready to go to where I'm going to go and this sermon's all about. So I'm going where he went to get to where he wanted to go. <laughs> now, you'll notice when he comes down toward the end of what we have in chapter 11, he says in verse 33, of all these people, and some of them he just calls their names and go into detail about them, who through faith, verse 33, subdued kingdoms, wrought or worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Why? That they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about and she sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, and these all having obtained a good report. A good report. What report was it? They were faithful to whatever God charged them to do, no matter what they had to undergo to be faithful. Through faith received not the promise. Now here's where he's going to move from what we have as chapter 11 in the last verse into what we have in chapter 12, but there weren't any chapters and verses. God having provided some better thing for us. Us who? Those Christians and anybody else that's a Christian. That they without us should not be made perfect. He never intended to stop with the Old Testament and the things that happened there. He intended that it be fulfilled and complete only in the New Testament, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. Now, I'll tell you, when I was listening to Ken speak, and he referred to Romans 15.4, and he referred to 1 Corinthians 10, the seed was sown on this, and I immediately said, mm, I think I want to go into that more. And then after hearing John speak on the matter of we're responsible for our decisions and the consequences that come because of them, now you can't escape this business of what he's about to say. Now watch it. It's based on what we just covered. That's the reason I said it's a lengthy introduction. So we come then to the verse 1 and verse 2, chapter 12. Wherefore? Well, do you remember what we said more times than I can count about therefore and thus and so 
and wherefore. It means in light of what I just told you, and based upon that, we conclude this. So wherefore, we conclude, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. You see, all these people who were faithful under patriarchy and under the law of Moses are pictured as being in a great stadium. And we're down here now with that better thing than they ever had. And they're, as it were, rooting for us to stay faithful to the New Testament system through thick and thin and pain and anguish and good times and bad times. Now what does he conclude in view of what they did when they had so much less than we did, but they were faithful to it? Look how he describes what they went through at the end of chapter 11. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Patience here means bearing up under the burden, whatever it may be, in order to win this race. That's the idea of patience. Now he says, looking unto Jesus. Well, how do I look unto Jesus today? I know his last will and testament. And I'm taught over and over again, one way or the other, to study it, to know it, to make all my evaluations in life concerning myself, my family, and everybody else, and everything else in the light of the teaching of the Bible. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of what? Of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, the part I want to emphasize is this bidding of the besetting sin. What is it to be beset? If I were to say you're beset by your family, <laughs> if I were to say you're beset by an army, or you're beset with a cloud of mosquitoes, or beset by a swarm of flies, or beset by a swarm of bees, especially if they're angry, Beset means you're surrounded by it. Some of the versions translate it entangled. Entangled. You know, in the model prayer, and I don't hear it mentioned much in our prayers, the prayer Jesus Christ of Nazareth, our Savior, gave us to go by to form our prayers. <laughs> he said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Temptation is what the devil does through the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, to solicit us to transgress God's will, sin to transgress of the law, 1 John 3, 4. And we must understand how he works. As Paul said, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, so I'm afraid some of us are. But I want you to look now at this sin which does so easily beset us. What is it? What has he just been talking about the importance of all the way through chapter 11 to introduce you to the first two verses, especially first one of chapter 12? What has he been emphasizing? Faith. Faith. The importance of faith. How those who did not have anything like the Christian has a knowledge of God, and yet they were faithful. Saw it asunder. You think about that for a minute but they would not cease doing what God required and even thrown in the den of uh, lions. Wouldn't stop praying. So he was thrown into a den of lions, Daniel that is, and so on and so forth. Your mind knows the Bible well enough to call those great examples. They did not have unbelief. The sin that thus so easily beset us is nothing less than unbelief. Now that tells us something about how the word belief or unfaithful, but especially belief, is used in the scriptures. It can be used to mean I don't accept the fact of the matter. I don't accept the facts that prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is deity. I just don't accept them. But that's not the only way it's used to talk about an unbeliever. Because you see it more from the standpoint of believers, 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 not unbelievers. A believer can be one who just simply accepts the fact of the matter. The devils also believe and tremble, James said. 
as Brother Wood used to say about that, but they're still devils. <laughs> they're believing, they're trembling, but they're still demons. The point is, he's talking about a belief that says Jesus Christ as Nazareth is the Son of God. And I know it. But faith is also used or belief to mean obedient servants of God. We too often just think of belief as mentally ascending to the fact of God's existence in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Bible is the Word of God. He's spending all of his time in chapter 11 by saying, no, it's not just that. It is that, but it is much more than that. It is your faith, confidence, belief in God and his system of salvation and the way he teaches us to live so that you perform the doing of it. You comply with his will. The besetting sin is a sin of unbelief. Now, Watch it. In case someone doesn't want to believe that. <laughs> Consider what transgression of God's law, sin of commission or omission, doesn't involve unbelief. Just sit up and make your list. Every sin we commit is because of unbelief. They said, well, I, I know I sin, but I believe in God, and I believe in Christ, and I believe in being baptized, blah, 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 blah. Now, let me take you to where this is even further developed. And that's in the little book right after Hebrews 12. Now, I want you to notice, or I should say Hebrews, I want you to notice, and we all know this, don't we? James was written to Baptist. That's right. The letter to James was written to every denomination who says that you're saved by faith only. Even though Baptist church had come to existence to 1,500 years after James was written, it was written to Baptists. Now, you know better than that. Not long ago, I pointed out most of the Bible, as you well know, as I said, is written to Christians, isn't it? Did James write to those outside of Christ? Did James write to those who had never believed in God, who didn't believe in Christ, who didn't believe in the gospel of Christ? Nope, he wrote to brethren. He wrote to people who had heard the gospel from the heart, believed it and obeyed it, Romans, 1, or Romans 6, 3 and 4 and 17 and 18, who believed in worshiping God in assemblies just as we know the Bible teaches. Well then, why did he say what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So if I, obviously there's a dead faith, that's the faith of devils. When he speaks of the devils believing and trembling, they don't have a living, active, obedient faith. And many times, brethren, just like these brethren who needed this letter originally, will talk about we believe this and we believe that. And we speak where the Bible speaks and we're silent where the Bible is silent. But it's only lip service in so many areas. The Hebrews needed it. And to get down to verse 1 of chapter 12, he took a whole chapter on faith. And the faith of people who didn't have the gospel. To teach the people who had the gospel a better thing for us to abide by. This besetting sin set forth in this passage is then the sin of unbelief because every time, as I said earlier, you sin, that's an area of unbelief because unbelief means disobedience. You can take believers and the believers who are believers in the sense of saved are obedient. Thus, Hebrews 5 verse 9 says, he's the author of his sermon, eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now, who's going to obey him? 
is the person who's had faith formed in him by the reception and an honest heart of the Word of God, realizing the will of God from the Word of God, then they comply with his wishes. Speak, Lord, thy servant hear me. Command, and I will obey. Why do you think Abraham is selected? Get out of your country from where you were born and leave your family. Of course, the next thing the Scripture says, say, oh, I'm not going unless you tell me where I'm going. But the Scripture deliberately records he did that not knowing whither he went. What does that demonstrate about confidence and trust in God to provide for him? So this sin of unbelief is involved in every sin of, of omission and commission. When you go back to the antediluvian world, how did they get to the state they were in that caused God to destroy the world by water? Unbelief. It means disobedience. And when you come on down through, I, I could, it doesn't make any difference which one you select. Then every one of those who had sinned, and you've read your Old Testament and know that, even God's children, it's because of unbelief. Notice that when you look at the Israelites, 20 years old and upward, why was it that those 20 years old and upward, that there were only two, Caleb and Joshua, that were able to enter the promised land? You know, there were well over 600,000 men, 20 years old and upward, just the men who left Egypt. And out of all of those who were 20 years old and upward, counting women too, which would put it over a million, only two, were faithful. Not even Moses. God informed Moses that unbelief prevented his entering the land of promise. Old accounts found in Numbers chapter 20, verses 7 through 12. But here's what God told Moses. Because ye believed me not to sanctify me before the children of Israel. That's the reason you're not going over. And that was the matter about the rock. Two times Moses, by God's power, got water out of the rock. The first time he struck it, God told him the second time to speak to it. But he got mad at him because... I would have been a long time before Moses being angry at them, I promise you. I'm always amazed that Moses was able to handle himself as he did. But he struck the rock, and thus he didn't set the proper example. Have you ever wondered how we know, and even the songwriter talked about Christ as a rock that's higher than I, old oh, end of the rock, let me fly? Have you never noticed that over when uh, Paul is writing, that you have to go all the way to the New Testament for the Holy Spirit through Paul to tell us the typology of the rock. And what was it? And they drank of that spiritual rock, which was Christ. So I know why Moses got himself in trouble. It wasn't just transgressing God's wall, law. He violated the type because he was a type of Christ. And when he wasn't faithful in speaking to the rock and let his anger lead him to hit the rock with the rod, then he violated the type. That was the sin. And he couldn't do that and not be punished. So he was not allowed to go over. And I have to go all the way to the Holy Spirit through Paul, the same Holy Spirit inspiring Moses, to find out that that rock is a type of Christ. So that that songwriter could say, Oh, then to the rock, let me fly. To the rock that is higher than I. We need to know those things. We need to know as we studied this just how the Holy Spirit used Old Testament matters to teach us how to be faithful to Jesus Christ and to learn something about this besetting sin that so hinders each one of us individually and our families and in so many other ways. When you think of after they first went over, Joshua leading them in the land of Canaan, and they take Jericho, they were told, you don't take a thing out of that city. Well, Achan took some stuff out of it, violated God's law, and here's something else about that. He did it because of unbelief. If he, did, if he had believed, he'd kept God's commandments. So he wouldn't have taken anything. But he didn't believe, so he violated the will of God. And Joshua and the rest of Israel, not knowing about it, had this little city over here called Ai. And they said, well, we, we don't need a bunch of folks to go do that. But sin was in the camp. 
and even in ignorance, in the case of Joshua and the rest of Israel, what AI did hurt the whole bunch. Got them whipped. You ever notice how God dealt with Joshua and he's falling on his face before the Lord, lamenting the whole thing? You ever notice what God said? The first thing he says to him, and I'm paraphrasing here, he said, get up. It's not time for prayer. It's a time for realizing that if I promised you I'd deliver all these people into your hands, if you were faithful to me, then since I didn't, since you weren't, since they weren't delivered into your hands, then what does that tell you about something in Israel? That's the way you should have thought. Somebody sinned. So he lines up. Now remember how many of those people there were. He lines up all these people, begins to go through, and then lo and behold, he comes to Achan. And Achan fesses up. Even after he fessed up, they stoned him. Written a four time for our learning. That was the point Ken was making. We all ought to from these Old Testament examples. It is not a light matter to be guilty of unbelief, which is simply to be guilty of failure to do what God said or transgressing what he said that we shouldn't do. You'll notice then those passages and why they got the seed going on this when Ken preached it and John talking about decisions because we, we decide whether we're going to do what we know God told us to do. All my life I've seen this. How many people said I'm a faithful member of the church but you don't know whether they're going to be regular in their worship attendance or not. That's unbelief. If you were to ask them to believe in Jesus, say, yes, well, you don't believe in him when it comes to assembling with the saints like the Bible teaches. That's the Lord's will that on the first day of the week in a congregation, all those saints come together if they can to worship God as the Lord prescribes. But they don't. But nothing's preventing them. I sat here a few weeks ago, and I, I've never been this long being sick or any other reason outside meeting with the saints, and I have been since November, December, and part of January. So where should uh, a Christian be on the first day of the week when the church of which he's a member assembles? Well, that's according to whether you're a believer or not. And it's interesting to me that it's in this same Hebrews letter that you have Hebrews 10, 25 that precedes this chapter 11 that we mentioned, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. But I claim to leave the Bible's word of God, but just, you know, kind of play with Hebrews 10, 25. But you can do that in everything enjoined upon us that's essential to being faithful to God in the church. Bible study, prayer. Oh, here's a biggie. Giving of our means. That doesn't seem to be something to where we think we can be guilty of the sin of unbelief. If you will see how much money you really give, just watch what you give to everything else that are the necessities of life, at least some of them, throughout the week. But what do you do for the Lord on the first day of the week regarding giving as you have been prospered? As I said earlier, the sin of unbelief that does so easily beset us, which we by our own will are to put aside, is involved in everything we do that's sin. Hebrews 4.2 sums up the whole thing. In view of all these things, and of course this was written earlier, I say it's 4, chapter 4. He says, let us fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you, should seem to come short of it. Hebrews 4.2. That's a pretty powerful statement. And it's said at the beginning of the book because of the people he's addressing and their condition spiritually. Jesus was challenged by unbelief. I won't go into all the details, but just look through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John 1, 11 and 12, he came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now watch how he ends this. Even to them that believe on his name. That's not just believe in the proper name Jesus Christ. It means by the authority of Christ. That's what Peter meant to those who were believers and made believers in Christ by the sermon preached by the apostles 
in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost of Jerusalem. When he said to those believers, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Christ, they weren't just talking about calling out the name of Christ. They mean by the authority of the king who has all authority as he authorizes in his word. Had a lady uh, early last week, we were talking in an office. I told her I was going in the next day to do that cardiac thing. And she said, I know you're going to be fine. Jesus save him. Well, I sat there and looked at her. I said, well, I prayed about it and I left it at that. <laughs> she had no more idea about what she was meaning when she said a second time, in the name of Jesus. She had no idea what she was saying. In the name of Jesus is by the authority of Christ, which authority is found only in his word. Thus we do what he says in the way he said it for the reason he said it, and that's being faithful. If you don't do that, you're guilty of unbelief that does so easily beset the majority of the world and many, many members of the church. Be thou faithful unto death, in order to death if needful be, and I'll give you a crown of life. And that covers when you're young, when you're middle-aged, when you're old and decrepit and you're falling apart, be faithful. I, I don't see how that uh, once some of us have gotten older and we have those particular things hitting us that are peculiar to age and so forth, and it's impossible for our years ahead to be as many as there are behind, how does that justify me not being faithful? It may mean I can't do a lot that I used to do because I'm not able, but it doesn't mean I'm excused. You, you see, young people, they're old enough to know they're in sin and lost. If they died now, they would go to hell. You say, that's all tough. Brethren, when I was 12 years old, I knew that was the case with me, and that's the reason on May 27, 1959, on a Wednesday night, I responded to the gospel invitation and was baptized into Christ. I didn't want to go to hell, and I'd been raised where I heard gospel preaching, and I understood it. And my conscience ate me alive. And there was a fear there that wasn't just awe and respect for God, though it was there. It was a fear of losing my soul. Because I didn't know at 12 when I'd, when I'd see the sun rise tomorrow or whether I'd be able to go to sleep that night. People say people can't know things. Well, I knew enough then. If little old Arkansas me at 12 years old could understand that with my brain. Tell me why other people can't. Yet I see in families, young people messing around just like, no big deal. They can get interested in everything else under the sun and they concentrate on that, but they don't pay any attention to this. And they can talk about tomorrow and they can talk about next year, but they don't get interested in saving their soul. That's a sin of unbelief. How many parents or not following the teaching of God concerning raising their children, or husbands being the wives, what they ought to be as the Bible teaches, and vice versa. That's sin of unbelief. Every sin, the violation of God's law, involves our lack of belief. And a true believer is like one in James chapter 2. You show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works, which in effect is saying you can't show me your faith, confidence, trust in God and Christ and the gospel system without compliance with his will. Thus is the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. And he does not set that aside. To be faithful is to be obedient, is to take God at his word, is to not gainsay it or speak against it or try to get around it. And if you see, and I close with this, that your life is such that you need to repent and you know that means a turning from whatever sin it is or sins to ceasing those things and doing what you know is right, then it's a sin of unbelief when you won't comply with the teaching of Acts 17.30. God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. If you had the belief like you ought to, you'd repent. To become a Christian, to step in the plan of salvation, or as a child of God, in repenting of any sins that you may have committed. And if you don't, you don't believe like you ought to. Now, the sin that does so easily beset us, 
Let's set it aside. Our wills concern us. That's where John's lesson comes in, our decisions and the consequences. In these Old Testament lessons, we're just applying what Ken emphasized in Romans 15, 4, 1 Corinthians 10. And don't be guilty of this sin that so easily beset those folks and so easily besets us, a sin of unbelief. If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time to do it. It's the only time you've got. If as a child of God, your sins have been public, brought reproach upon the blood-bought body of Christ, we ask you to repent of those sins, humble yourself, and confess them, and we'll pray with you and for you that you be forgiven. And why not do that now? It's the only time you have. It's the time God's granted you. Do it now while we stand and sing.